question comes from one of you. It's a great one too. It's how do I help my kid get outside of their comfort zone? And Mike and I dive deep into this one today. Uh, it is a fantastic question that, that hopefully we give a fantastic answer to. We can't get, wait to get your feedback. I uh, also want to remind all of you, we've been getting a lot of submissions from you lately, which we love. Send them over to team at ourkidsplayhockey.com. You can send it as a voice message. You can type it however you want to get that communication to us. Uh, we really do love answering your questions. So again, email us at team at ourkidsplayhockey.com. And whenever you're listening to this, remember, you guys get a great deal at hockeywraparound.com. 25% off the uh, entire wraparound product store uh, from the wraparound itself to the dry stick to the When Hockey Stops book that Christy Casciano Burns and I wrote uh, by using the code OKPH at checkout on hockeywraparound.com. You get a awesome discount. So go check that out, HockeyWrapAround.com, uh, and, and enjoy this episode with Mike and I on Our Kids Play Hockey, which is also OurKidsPlayHockey.com. You can check us out there, too. Enjoy the episode! Hello, hockey friends and families around the world, and welcome to another edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. I'm Lee Elias, and that's Mike Benelli. Now, for those of you watching the episode, you might notice I'm in the old Our Kids Play Hockey studio, which is also my office upstairs at my house, which was created during COVID because you needed some place to record. And the reason I'm here, Mike... Is because I'm under the weather and I did not want to go to the office and make sure that our producer got anything that I have. But you could say I'm outside of my comfort zone today, but the show must go on, Mike. That's one of the things about you and me and Christy. The show must go on. And that is today's topic. We got an email from Joe. That's the only name on here. Can't say anything else. Joe asked us, Mike, how do you encourage your kids to play outside their comfort zone? And I wanted to practice what he was preaching. So I'm outside my comfort zone, and that's what we're going to discuss today on Our Kids Play Hockey. Well, it, that and and, uh, and everybody commends you for this. I mean, I know it's a real sacrifice, and uh, <laughs> you know, you know yeah. sometimes it's hard. You look around, you're like, "Where's my microphone? Where's my?" It's a different pad? mic. Where's I mean, it's it's seat, it's a different mic. Fit. Yeah, the seat doesn't fit as well. It yeah. makes it it makes it harder. I mean, I think when we you know Christy does it too, when when we do these remote. Uh, call-ins, you know, when you're when you're traveling or you're at a hockey tournament or, you know, listen, we, we uh, parents do it all the time, right? We're out of our comfort zone uh, on all these hockey tournaments as well. All of a sudden, you got to got to leave on a Wednesday to go to a tournament, uh, you know. Yeah, Mike, I, I will <laughs> admit though, when when you do episodes in Florida and you're in a t-shirt and the ocean's behind you and you can hear that ocean breeze in your microphone, it doesn't yeah. look too uncomfortable. Uh, I, well, no, but like, it is like... out of my comfort zone. I'm <laughs> yeah, not saying I'm not comfortable. I get it. That's a fair point. Yeah. Just, but it, no, you're absolutely right. It is it, it's, uh, and, and getting players to play outside their comfort zone. That's, I, I love the subject because I think it it takes everybody to allow that to happen. It takes everybody that's in that 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 player's uh, world and ecosystem. Um, that's the only way a player truly can play outside their comfort zone. Everybody has to be on the same page about it. Yeah, well, I, I think you said the key word here. And if we're going to attack this again, this question is how do you encourage kids to play outside their comfort zone? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is you 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 almost can't do it if the environment is not correct for it. So we talk a lot about culture on this show, um, and I'm going to kind of shift that word today to environment. As a coach, as parents, as an organization, as a teammate, uh, you can create an environment that's conducive for kids to learn. Now, I assume when they say go outside their comfort zone, it's to push yourself beyond uh, uh, an aspect of the game that you're not good at, all right? Become a better skater, shooter, passer, hitter, you know, whatever, IQ, to push yourself past the point of fearing failure, right? To me, that's where most people's comfort zone gets messed up is I don't want to mess up. And this is a game, I've said it many times, the whole idea of the game is to capitalize on someone else's mistake. So the first thing to do is ask yourself or or do an audit well, what kind of environment have I created for my players or for my kids? Is it an environment where they are afraid to make mistakes? Because you, you, Mike, in my opinion, that's the first thing you have to conquer. And you have to make sure these kids understand, hey, it's okay to fall down. It's okay to make a mistake. Yeah, and that's hard because even when you're given permission to do that, you don't feel like you can do it, right? Because, you know, kids are kids are like, oh, you know, you know you're not going to get punished if you do this. But then all the other pressures come about that when you do make a mistake 
and you play outside. I mean, we, I see it a lot. I mean, I, I think it really depends on the age of your kid too, right? Because you yeah, can get matters. a you can get a, a six year old to play way outside their comfort zone it's true. because they don't they, they're not self conscious about the way they look. Try doing that with a sixteen year old. Now you got forget about it. It's like right. everything's involved. Like it's just a whole nother uh, level of um, self awareness and and you know uncertainty and and being you know just being embarrassed like like you know six year olds just don't get embarrassed they just do it like they don't they they, they rarely are worried about what other people are thinking of them or if somebody's going to post something on YouTube or you know they're not thinking about that kind of stuff what what the comfort zone piece and I'll t- and I'll tell you the best players you know do, do they do that do you do you play out do you allow that 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 you know uncomfortableness to happen in private like do you allow that do you allow that player to have the freedom to do that in a safe space um you know where they're not doing it in the middle you know of a game right uh because we can say because i could tell you right now i tell players all the time do not be afraid to make a mistake here right you you can make that move at the blue line and nobody is going to be upset with you if a goal gets scored but then the goal gets scored and everybody's upset with them well, look, so, let, let's we got to break it down now. So, so listen, you make a great point, right? I think people go, well, I'll just tell the people it's okay to fail. Uh, and I'm going to tell you this, Mike, and this is my opinion. That's not enough, right? There's a lot of elements that have to be built to create this environment that I'm talking about. Num- number one, and, and this should all be done at the start of the season, but is establishing trust and defining that word for the team, not just the individual. And I do a lot of speaking on this, right? You have to create that trust environment. And within that trust, there has to be A, clear communication and B, high levels of accountability. Now, you can accomplish this at a lot of different ages. Now, an understanding of communication and accountability from 6 to 16 is going to be a little different. But I'm telling you from experience, you can start to build that. So once the trust is there, you have to explain to your team how you may communicate. And it may be, look, I'm going to be very point blank and I'm going to almost look mean, but I'm going to be honest with you. And when I'm honest with you, I'm telling you what I want you to do in a game. So I'm giving you clear feedback on what to change. That's not going to feel good to you, but I'm giving you actionable items to move forward with. Just saying that can do a lot. And then the last aspect is accountability is telling the players, listen, you're going to fail. I want you to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and to push yourself to do better at practice so mistakes don't happen in a game. And if a mistake happens in a game, I need you the player and parents, you can say this too, to be accountable for the situation. So if in the first period you make the same mistake three times and I bench you, which I think is, is at an, an older age adequate, right? I want you to come up to me after the game as much as I want to come to you and say, this is what we're going to work on at practice. So that doesn't happen again. The, the thing about being uncomfortable, and this is where I always lean on the military, Mike, because the military does such this great, a great job of making the uncomfortable comfortable. Right. And that's actually how they talk about it. It, it, it. The way they say it is embrace the suck. Right. And it's it's a mindset of you are going to mess up. You are going to be uncomfortable. And again, in the military, they, they'll put you in sub zero temperatures, extreme heat. They'll put you in situations to purposely be uncomfortable so you can learn how to get past it. And from the military people that I speak to, it's not like you don't ever get really used to it, but you train your mind to be used to it so that you're somewhat bulletproof in those situations. Now, I think this is a six to 18 year old process. This is part of the development. I think one of the failures is that we don't look at it like that, right? We don't look at this like it's a, it's a 12 year journey for a, a little kid to become a young, young adult, right? And that, that learning trust, communication, accountability, and there's a lot of other pillars in this too, are ways to help you get comfortable because, you know, taking this a little broader, Right. And again, we will answer the question. I'm giving some 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 tips now. Uh, the amount of kids we see get to college or post high school and hit adversity and they can't deal with it. To me, it's like we're failing them on the ice by not teaching them how to deal with it. So, again, my first steps, how to encourage kids to play outside their comfort zone. Trust. Clear communication. There's, I can tell you this as a player, my friends. There is nothing worse as a player. Nothing worse. When a coach is not clear with their communication or, and this is even worse, uh, they tiptoe around it and they don't tell you what they want or they manipulate things and they do things to you to, to they think is going to inspire you and it's just ripping you apart inside. That is a very old school model that is not really working anymore. 
right? We just saw Mike Babcock get fired again because of this, right? Whether whether it was intentional or not, I'll say that, right? Yeah. If you want to encourage me or a player to get outside their comfort zone, you have to build trust. That person has to trust you. And they have to know that it's it's A, it's okay to fail as long as you're willing to learn. I've always told my players, Mike, if you make the same mistake over and over and over again, we have a bigger problem, right? But the players, I mean, let's just talk youth, youth hockey. Let's just talk squirt down. You should be messing up the beginning of the season. You're not supposed to be where you're at there. The team should be better by the end of the season, right? When you get to the higher levels, it's about maintaining excellence all the time. At the squirt level, even the peewee level, you haven't even activated all this parts of the game yet you're not even hitting yet so this is this is a process and the best coaches create the environment and parents i gotta keep saying that parents do this too where being uncomfortable or failing because i think that's what we mean by uncomfortable is okay because there's an understanding they're going to learn i'm going to stop talking because i'm holding the microphone that this microphone makes me talk more mike apparently i'm going to toss it back to you no, you're making great points. And I think it's just, it's just really, you know, comes down to also, I think understanding, you know, when, when are you allowing that, that the ability to be uncomfortable and explore these opportunities. And that's where training and practice come in. Right. Because right. if you, if you train, you know, what do you, what do you, what's the term you, you train to your lowest training? Like you, you play to your lowest yeah. training. So yeah, I, if, I prefer the, uh, uh, we make the practices hard. So the games are easy. It's like the, that's like, the right. Right. So, that, <laughs> so, so instead of falling to what, what you're, you know, the fact that you're not prepared, you, right. you, you fall to your training, right? So if your training is high level and, and intense and you're allowed to make mistake, like to me, if I have 40 reps in a training session and I can take rep one and rep 40, and make them completely different because I've succeeded right now is then, then the, the green light happens where, you know what? I, I mean, let, let's, let's like, honestly, like the, the Michigan goal, right. That didn't happen by Mike leg doing that once in a game and saying, I'm just going to come up with this yeah. move. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. I, I it, you know, and the story is, and I'm sure it's true because everyone I've seen other players um, in these situations, he probably worked on that a million times in practice in his backyard in his living room and it's like all that all that skill happened and i gar i you know it, i i use the i use it all i i use the um the examples a lot with the older kids that you know when they see these like uh instagram videos of kids catching pucks on the on the heel of their stick and you know flipping it up to their the shaft of the stick and catching it on the butt end like i'm like that wasn't the first take no like they probably they they probably flunked out of school trying to figure that out. Like so, like they like they just they they worked on it a lot, and you know we're in a world that that we have to make sure as parents and coaches too that we allow those other things to happen in a training environment so that they can have the freedom to do that in the game. And then when they fail in the game, maybe it's like okay, then 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 it's like well where where's the line? Like, where's the line? We have to sit a kid down and what, like to your point, what's the age right. that you see, have to sit a kid down and say, listen, we, we've tried this. We've tried this too much. And it's just not in your, it's, it's, it's just not in your wheelhouse or your, you know, tool bag to be able to do this. So maybe, maybe we need to think of a different way to, to do that, you know, explore that, uh, uh this great yeah. play that you want to make. Yeah, Mike, I think we should say too, this has got the environment I'm talking about is a controlled environment. It's not just open creativity to do whatever you want. For example, if you're on a two on one and you try and Michigan, the puck at the, the hash mark, um, it's going to make me pretty mad as a coach. Right. So it's not freedom in that sense, complete freedom, but it's in an environment where creativity can take place within a structured system. The other thing you're making some great points here, you know, uh, when Mike Leg did that, it was late nineties, right? Uh, the first, the first Michigan, because he was at Michigan, he played for Michigan. Um, right. uh, you know, another one that comes to my mind is Merrick Malik uh, in the early two thousands. The first time I had ever seen anyone put the stick between their legs on a shootout, on a breakaway situation, and everyone was blown away. Now, this is a common move now in the league. This is something we see all the time. I, in and, the no, and nobody, and even even Don Cherry won't uh, dismiss it at this. <laughs> yeah, point, that's true, right? Yeah. Right. But He's like, oh, well, whatever. I guess nobody's going to beat him up and and, and nobody's dis- getting disrespected. I mean, right. you know, and that's but that's that's the thing. You're right. It's like, well, 
but I, I, I just can't imagine him going down the ice saying, oh, you know what? This you know what would be cool? <laughs> you know what would be cool if I tried this for the first time? No. But here's the thing. This is why I bring up Merritt Malik, because I know for a fact NHL players had done that at practice for decades just for fun, right? Now, you're making a good point. In the 80s and 90s, if you did something like that, you were you're going to lose a tooth. Okay, that's just the way the game was played back then. But the game opened up and it allowed for that. Now, now we see between the leg moves. Well, nobody attacked weekly. him. Nobody attacked him, did he? Did no, he get they, beat up everybody, the next game? I just remember John Davidson, the the, the, the uh, <clears throat> color commentary, go, ah! like just couldn't believe that he did that. But believe the, it because I mean, because again, yeah. that's you, you're, to your point. That's commonplace right now. It's like right, like I every week it's, we it's see probably it. it's on every shootout. Yeah, uh, you know, there's a shootout every week that has that in it. We see weekly some play between the legs. This is again, this is the first time it happened. I think it was back in 0304 time period. All right. right. And and now you're seeing other things too. Like, like again, the Michigan is pretty, pretty not, I wouldn't say normalized yet, but it happens uh uh more often than than it used to. Now, you made a great point here um that I want to talk about here for the parents listening. You talk about some of these influencers and creators who do unbelievable magic wand stuff with their sticks. And it is, it's unbelievable. Let me tell you how you could tell yes. if it's the first time they've ever done it on video. They won't look nonchalant after they've done it. If they do it and they look like, yeah, that's easy. That's because they've been practicing it for, for years and years and years. And again, look, it takes immense talent to do that. But this is one of my problems with, with uh, some of these creators. Okay. Um, I want to I want to reiterate. I'm not against creativity in the sport. I'm not against having fun, but we're in a time period now where kids go online and they will see a kid flip it up, catch it upside down around a goalie, and think, "Oh man, I can't do that. I, I better learn to do that." And they still have not yet learned how to take a correct wrist shot or a snap shot, or the amount of stuff I hear about. Well, we got to learn toe drag release. Toe drag release is how you shoot now. Toe drag release right, right. is a shot. It is an effective shot. I'm not against it. It is one of many types of shots. Yeah. You should learn all the shots, not just the, the the hyped up one, the TDR as they call it, which again, which was also, by the way, happening in the 90s. They were doing this in the NHL in the 90s. They just people finally wised up to it. Uh, again, for those of you listening, it's it's a it's a toe drag and then right into a snapshot, uh, which which yeah. does a lot to mess with the goalie, to to be fair. All right. But the point I'm making here. I think Mike Woodrow, Bossy actually got it better than anyone else. But I, yeah, well, hey, listen, he's at the time the greatest goal scorer in the sport. All right. So the, the reason I'm bringing this up is this. We talked about the environment. Your kids are living in a social media environment where they're watching a human highlight reel. Yeah. Right. And they're going to get uncomfortable potentially at not being able to do those stick tricks or they get comfortable doing the stick tricks and they get on the ice and their hockey IQ is so low. I'm going to say this. I've said this on many episodes, parents. The, the biggest thing that Mike and I are seeing and, and high level coaches across hockey, you're always looking for ways to give yourself an advantage uh, for your kids. And, and I get it. Hockey IQs are very low. We're seeing older players yeah. like 17, 18 with immense talent and very low hockey IQ, right? To the point where we see a kid with massive hockey IQ. Now he's becoming the cream of the crop. Now, he might not be able to pick the puck up and flip it over seven times, but he knows where to be in a one one three, or he knows what to do when it's a three on two situation. And, 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 and there and there is there is a uh, there's a combination of both, right? There's like I said, there's a lot of guys with really high hockey IQ that that can do all the all the really intricate movements and and plays, which is really good. But I think I think yeah, well, you know, not to track, but don't <laughs> but don't don't you know don't sabotage or or, or you know, get on this tangent of of thinking. You know, you're gonna do, the, you're gonna work on a play that you could probably only use once in your lifetime right. uh, over being <laughs> a, a, a smart hockey player. Right. Well, look, I'll take it a step further. Let's talk about practice. Let's talk about this from a coaching standpoint. Uh, I have a yeah. team right now. Uh, I'd say passing is a skill that's extremely lacking. Right. So guess what we're gonna practice? Passing. Now, this is the key: get kids outside their comfort zone. It's on me and the coaching staff to adequately explain prior to practice, this is what we're working on and why. All right. So many coaches forget to give their kids the why. If you don't give them the why to get them out of the comfort zone, they're just going to do whatever you tell them to do because you're telling them to do it. Now, if you give them a, we're doing this drill to improve on our passing skills, or if you want to get more advanced, we're doing this drill to improve our breakout 
right? Or to improve our cross ice dumps because it will help us this way. That's a huge part of creating the environment. Now you've given a reason for them to learn. That will help them step mm. out of their environment. Okay. Then here's the other part. And again, depending on the age, can you make the drills fun? Right. So we're going to do a, a playmaking clinic, if you will. I'm going to, I'm going to try and make as many of those drills fun where it's okay if you fail. In fact, I'm going to do a drill in a few weeks, Mike, you'll like this. Um, I have middle school kids and elementary school kids ages out there together. Right. And this is just the way this clinic has been organized. So we're doing a playmaking clinic. You want to talk about getting kids outside their, their, um, uh, comfort zone. We're going to play at a game at the end where we talk about mentorship a lot with these kids. The middle school kids are only going to be able to pass to the elementary school kids. They cannot shoot. Now think about this. If you're eight years old and there's a 12 year old out there and you know, they can't shoot, but they have to pass to you. Does that enable you to come outside of your comfort zone a little bit? Cause I'll tell you right now, when you're eight and there's a 12 year old, right. you're terrified. That kid's a lot bigger than you. They, they know more than you. They, their voice is deeper than yours. They skate faster than you. Right. You know, I'm creating right. the environment where they can all succeed together, right? Um, and I could always well, reverse just, it too. And there's, there's, there's so much, there's so much mentorship going on in there, and there's so, so much like, uh, you know, uh, you know, humility going on there. I mean, that's great. I mean, those are kind of like those are the kind of things where, as a coach, you're 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 you're, you're kind of setting the parameters, creating the environment. Of, uh, of, of the environment. Right. But then, right. but then the kids, you know, hopefully embrace that and understand that this is a positive thing for them. Well, and, and let me say this, so you can have the parent be like, I can't believe my kid is out I, there. I'm not worried about the stuff. parents because here's why. And, and again, I, sometimes I invite the parents in to listen. I talked a minute ago. What's the why here? You know, the drill, you know, the outcome of the drill. You want to get better at passing, you know, the drill, the why, right. well, middle school kids, I want you to learn a little bit about mentorship. These kids look up to you just like you look up to the high school kids. Do you remember when you were eight years old and a 12 year old might have passed the puck to you, how that would make you feel? Now I'm enabling them to understand, wow, there's something more here than me just passing the puck, right? right? How about this? Do you think now they're a little more invested in making a good pass? Because there's a good chance these elementary school kids are not going to be able to catch a, a lightning hard pass. So now they got to work on their touch. They got to work on their placement. They got to work on their encouragement. There's a high chance the pass will fail every time. Is right. that uncomfortable? Yes. Are we moving out of the uncomfortable zone because we're doing it together as a team? Have I developed trust? Have I developed communication? Have I developed accountability? All of it within one drill. But it has to be communicated correctly. Now, imagine if I was just out, went out there, Mike. Again, for everybody listening. All right, no explanation. All right, middle school kids, you can only pass. You can't shoot, sorry. Uh, elementary school kids, you better score when they pass to you. Now I've just created an uncomfortable environment. You think those middle school kids are going to skate hard? Like, I don't want to play where I can't shoot. So a lot of this just comes down to, to the environment. Again, it's always going to come after me, for me, the environment you're creating. Now, coaches, uh, it is on you to, to try and develop some of this environment and these drills. Like, you should be putting fun in. The best coaches I see, Mike, especially at youth hockey, man, they make it fun, but there's a purpose behind it. Right. It's not just like, hey, there's hula hoops on the ice. Let's go jump. There. No, there's a reason behind the hula hoops on the ice. And you're communicating that effectively. Now, parents, I do want to turn this to. Are you the parent? I'm not I mean, I'm not pointing fingers at any of you. You're listening. Are you the parent in the car that's saying to your kid after the game? Well, if 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 Sally had passed you the puck, we would have won. Or if this kid wasn't such a puck hog, we would have won. You're not helping. You are now creating an unaccountable player. The, 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 first off, you should never be coaching in the car after the game anyway. But the questions, great questions demand great answers. It's not if Sally had passed you the puck, we would have won. It is Sally didn't pass you the puck. What would you have done in that situation differently to help the team? Or how can you encourage Sally to see you on the ice? Because nine times out of 10, they don't even see you, right? To pass that puck. How could that be more cohesive for the team? That's a great question. Now the kid has to think about that. All right. Kid might come back and say, well, I'm just going to go punch Sally in the head and her helmet to make sure she knows that. Time. No, no, no. That's not a good thing to do. Now, now you've had a conducive conversation. Right. I, I just think my parents play a role in this, too. I mean, how do you reprimand? And we all do. How do you reprimand your kids when they do something wrong? You know, one of the best pieces of advice I got as a parent, Mike, and I'm not I fail at this one all the time, is that uh, it's it was that statement of you don't say to the kid, why would you leave your dishes out? You're supposed to say, hey, put your dishes in the sink, 
right? Like I think about that. Now your kid spends more time with you, the parents than anybody else. So if you want them to be comfortable with the uncomfortable, you need to create that environment at home, which, but which I'm going to say is not always easy. <laughs> I'm a parent. It is not always easy. Sometimes you just need yeah. those little people to go to bed. So, you know, you can watch your TV show or read your book, but I think a lot of this plays into home. Yeah. But, that, but again, it's, it's at youth, at the youth hockey level, going back to the question, right. Is, is it's a holistic approach. It's everyone has to be on the same page. The it's, it's the conversation between coach, player, parent, private trainer, but, you know, whatever that is, because you're going to have your your one on one trainers like, oh, my God, you're, you you can do this. You should try this in a game. Oh, my coach doesn't let me do this in a game, because if I do this, I'm going to staff for three periods. Oh, your coach is an idiot. They don't know what they're talking about. Ooh. Well, they are your it is their coach. So I, I, I think it's like, you know, that's that's where all that conversation has to come in. And as you get higher in the higher in the pecking order and we've talked to we talked to pro trainers on the show that that will say, listen, I don't try to change. I don't want to be in conflict with the head coach. Right. I want to be in in collusion with yeah, the head coach. I want to make yeah, sure, yeah. yeah and, and that we're that we're on the same page and I'm helping the player improve for the position that they're in. Right. Not 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 now. If I can find ways to allow that player to have more creativity and you know be more accountable for knowing that they can make mistakes. But that's a process that I have to build in. Right. It's not just like, hey, it listen, takes time. now I'm your new coach, and this is how we're doing it. Yeah, I, I, Mike, I think we should also make, it takes time to build that process. Your kid's not just going to go from being uncomfortable to comfortable overnight. This could take a whole season, right? Uh, or, yeah, or, and, and or you also months, don't want to yeah. go the other way where it's always uncomfortable. Like, I, I, I right. you know, I, I love the uh, the statement all the time. I hear it at the youth hockey level that, you know, to be the best, you got to play the best. I'm like, yeah, but not if you don't ever get to touch the puck. Like you're uncomfortable (laughs) then for the whole year. Like, oh, our kids played. We went 0 and 60 and we played the best teams in the country. I'm like, yeah, but but you never touched the puck. So you don't get better by not playing. (laughs) You don't get better by getting your butt kicked. You get better by being in competitive situations where then you can try to explore these things that 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 may or may not work. And then you figure out and you deduce that, hmm. Me, ca- me carrying the puck over the blue line and doing a spinorama has resulted in seven goals against me, <laughs> as opposed to my skill set saying, if I put the puck down low and beat the crap out of somebody and get the puck out and score, that's probably more in my skill set. Now, can I work on the spinorama? Yes, For but sure. there's pain associated yeah. with that. So that's where the the process happens and the age and, and your ability and, and just you know, I think this goes back to a conversation we've had too in a couple of shows where, you know, we talk about like the, your role, your role as a player. Like, are you, do you understand your role and do you understand your skill set? So are you working on that skill set? If you're never working on, if you think you're this player, but you never work on being that player, then you're right. not that player. Right. <laughs> so, well, I, mean, yeah, so. I, I think too, Mike, that, that the things that make you uncomfortable, uh, you, you know, are it's it's an opportunity right like so like a lot of the drills i do off ice they're designed to make you uncomfortable and designed to to showcase where you're failing right because we want to uncover that so you can work on it now listen there's there's two schools of thought on this okay um and i'm going to break them down let's just use alex ovechkin he's a great example right he is the greatest goal scorer in nhl history i'm saying that even before he's broken the record which he's going to break right 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 his first few years in the league um, when he was younger, you know, the coaches really tried to have him submit to more of a two-way player. And then eventually, <clears throat> I think it was Barry Trotz came in and let him loose. Let him loose. Go yeah. score goals. That's what you're great at. Now, here's my point. It's easy to look at that and go, yeah, that, that that's someone leaning into their skill sets. That's what you should do. Well, he's Alex Ovechkin. He can make the claim as the greatest goal scorer of all time that that's exactly what you should let him do because he's the best in the world at it. Right. My nine-year-old is not Alex Ovechkin. So when I see my son or daughter having a problem with something like passing, right? Well, that's a red flag to me. Let's go work on our passing, right? Let's go work on our passing. Let's make sure that that works, all right? So I think that when your kid's uncomfortable with something, a skill set, you can see and you can go to that kid and say, hey, listen, I noticed you're having a hard time with this. 
I noticed that, uh, that that you need to work on this, and that can be an opportunity. Mike, here's a question for you. Do you remember overspeed training? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. You just yeah. All right. Overspeed training, in addition to making me a better skater, taught me something about myself. So just for everybody listening, I don't, I don't think we do this too much anymore, but overspeed training were drills where you would go and get faster and faster and faster. The, the goal of the drill was to fail. Right. So a really quick one, it'd be like, go skate around the circle. And I want you to speed up until you, you lose your edge and you, you, you fall down. Basically, you cannot go any faster than you're going. And it was an amazing drill because it's designed for you to fail. It's designed for you to be uncomfortable. And you know what ends up happening? It's like the weighted bat. You get a little faster every time. And suddenly you're skating unbelievably faster than you were because you were willing to push yourself beyond the limit. But overspeed training you knew that was the goal. You're going to go to failure, right? That was pushing, yeah, that, that's what I learned. Falling, and when everybody else was falling, it didn't seem like out of the norm. Like you're like, okay, well, everybody's right. falling. Right. And, and, so, and that's the thing like, is like, yeah, we talk about the environment. Now that was a proven tra uh, training method. Now I think, I think they have stopped doing it because if you fall in the wrong place and hit the boards, it could be a little dangerous, right? But the, the idea of, of go until you fail, right? Look, First thing I teach, learn to skate or Adams. First thing I teach them when I step on the ice, I say, what is the first rule of hockey? And the answer is, it is okay to fall down. It is the first lesson we teach kids when skating. It's okay to fail. Somewhere along the line, we kind of lose sight of that, right? I, I always equate this, Mike, to like a kid learning to walk. Like we're real patient and encouraging with as parents. You know, oh, come on, you can get it. You get on your knees, you can crawl, you can walk. You can take your first step. You did it, you did it. We're super patient with that. But, you know, yeah. if a kid doesn't make a pass on a two-on-one, we lose our minds, right? You, you got it. If there's anything I've learned on the Our Kids Play Hockey journey from episode one to now, from my, my son is an Adam, who's now a squirt, and all the coaching I've done, it's I've learned patience. I, I've learned it might take an entire season for a kid to learn a somewhat what seems basic skill and that's okay it's okay because they're kids they're kids this is the we got to keep that in mind right. yeah but everything's a rush so i think i think it all depends on like again this is all environmental influencing of, of you know where who you're where you're at who you think your kid is what program you're in where you know where your the threshold is for your own um you know nervousness about your child's development and again throwing it all in there that if you put yourself on a uh, a bigger platform that does not encourage mistakes because it it causes pain for a team and, and rankings and a, and a and a coach's i don't know ego that this all comes back to you know be aware of what what, what situation you're in so yeah i mean listen we all want we all want to create environments where being being outside your comfort zone improves whatever you're trying to do, right? So if I'm training, uh, you know, using your military analogy is probably a great analogy, right? If I'm training to be a sniper right. in the desert, right. I'm probably going to have a lot of training where there's a lot of sand blowing around yeah. me and, and, and it's going to be hot and sweaty and a tarantula is probably going to climb up my back or something, you know? So it's like, you know, so, so, <laughs> so there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of, you know, instances there where, you know, if I'm training a defenseman and I want them to put their stick in the right place, I'm probably going to create a lot of environments uh, uh, in that against that defenseman in training that makes him put that stick in a certain right. place. Right. And positively or negatively, like sometimes, you know, we'll do a drill and say, listen, this is where I want you to position yourself. But coach, if I position myself there, the guy's going to beat me every time. Yeah, that's the whole point, because you have to you have to realize when that's happening. Right. Like, I want you to realize when you are in that because you're in that position a lot, by the way. Yeah. So, yeah. when you're, you know, <laughs> negative 19. So if you're going to be in that position, I'm going to put you in that position even more. So then we can we can deduce what needs to be done to fix yeah. it. Well, that's coaching. Why, why do we do the drills where we have the kids flip their sticks upside down? It's a great drill. Don't rely on that. Now I made it harder. You know, and again, like other things too, I used to do a drill um, where Mike, I didn't feel like the, the team was going to the net enough. 
I had them do drills where there's no pucks and they had to go to the net just to have it sink in. And it, it wasn't, it wasn't negative. It was like, no, get it through your head. You're going to the net all the time yeah. on this situation. So they, they learned to recognize, as you said, Mike, the situation and it, it, it improved. You know, I, we should say this too, Mike, th- there's a little creativity here on the coach's part to find new ways to do things. Kids don't want to do the same drill for nine months, right? Find creative ways to make it fun. Find creative ways to make it different. I love what you just said of, no, I'm going to put you in the most uncomfortable position possible. And look, you're hundred percent right about the military, warm weather training, cold weather training. And when they do this training, they don't just go, okay, it's going to be cold. No, it's like, we're going to expose you to the coldest. I want you to know what freezing feels like. I want you to know what it feels like to have mild hypother- hypothermia. You're going to sign a contract. I, I mean, I don't know if they go that far. I wouldn't put it. I mean, you get, go yeah, look no, at I, the I Navy to, SEALs. I want you to feel, I want you to feel what, what the verge of, 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 of suffocating feels like. I want you yeah. to, I want you to feel what right where you think, uh, what's the, what's the study that you always see? Like you put a, a they put a mouse in water and, and it, it, yeah. they didn't help ever drown, but it if they helped it a little bit, it stayed for like seven hours. Like does right. like that survival. Uh, it had hope. Inst- yeah. And, and, and that's the way I look at kids, like get them in survival instincts, get them into a place where they know, yes, I failed, but I can recover from that. Like, right. yes, that was terrible, but I can recover from that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm going to try and I'm going to feel bad and I'm going to, but I can recover from that. That's the beauty about yeah. sport. I mean, that's why we play sports. I hope, I mean, other than the scholarship and the money and, and the girls and the fame, <laughs> we play sport for the learning process of failing, getting up and trying again. That's yeah. it. And and that we can create those environments. We can put constraint-based learning into sport especially the, with the younger kids because it's easy they're they're dumb like you could just do more with them you could just create you could create constraints that they don't understand but you know why you're doing it right it, but it takes a little effort it takes a little thought and it can't just be you know three on three cross ice with the you know over and over and over again like what's the constraint what's the purpose what's the mission why are we doing this when are we doing this what is the outcome we want who do we want to play where and when and why all that kind of stuff comes, and that's I, I, that is coaching, parenting, directing. It, it, Takes a know, village. Inspiring. It's, it's just it's just making all that happen. So I think you know you can create these environments. You want to create these environments. We need to create these environments uh, in order for players to get better. Yeah. Well, and look, uh, I'll just say this in closing, and this is something we like to say a lot around the show: the ROI of youth hockey, eighteen down is the life lessons your son or daughter learns as they move into the quote unquote real world. That is the ROI. They are going to be infinitely better prepared for life because they'll know how to deal with adversity. They'll know how to be part of a team. They will know how to win. They will know how to fail. They will know how to rise. That is the ROI. Even if your kid is the number one overall draft pick in the NHL, that is still the ROI because you cannot play forever. NHL, or if you are an adult league Hall of Famer like myself, one day they will raise that banner, Mike. It will be in my office. No one will be there but me. Maybe my kids will come. Right. The ROI right. is I was better prepared for my life. That's what you're paying for. All right? No we don't have an that. NCAA football committee here. Thank goodness. All right? You know, where you can go, like Mike, you said, you can go 12-0 and not make it to the championship. All right. <laughs> great episode. I, I hope we answered no Joe's question. <laughs> right? Yeah, I know. We, we've got it always in a roundabout way, but I think, you know, listen, that, that there is, a, you know, I, I, how do you do it? There's so many different ways. And, and I think we can, uh, yeah. you know, but in hockey related terms, it's just, con- you know, constraining the environment they're in, mo- manipulating the environment they're in, influencing how you want them to react in certain situations. You can do that. And you can do it in a way um, that that helps the child for sure. Right. I, I think it all comes down to environment. I think we did a good job discussing that today. Listen, if you're listening and you have a question or a comment about any of this, you can always email us, team at ourkidsplayhockey.com. You can send it via text. Uh, we've had people send us uh, voicemails. You can DM them to us. We really love when you ask the questions. Uh, again, there's no shortage of topics here for us, but uh, as we continue to try and serve you, uh, we want to know what you're thinking. And and I'll be honest with you. Every question we've been asked, Mike, I don't know if you know this, every question that's come in, we've answered. There's never been one question 
come in where we're like, well, that's a dumb question. They're all legit. They're all good questions. And then the amount of questions we answer off the air, right? The amount of emails we get directly that's like, hey, listen, don't talk about this on the show. But <laughs> I've had that happen multiple yeah. times. Uh, but well, anybody listen. know I listen to your show, but. Yeah, yeah. We, don't, we can't tell anybody. Yeah, just give us that five-star review on uh, on Spotify or Apple, wherever you listen. That right. really helps us a lot. Uh, listen, I think I'm going to close it out here. This has been a great episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. Remember all of the episodes, ourkidsplayhockey.com or wherever you listen to hockey podcasts. And if you have not done so already, uh, our Facebook group is growing immensely. Uh, it's called Our Kids Play Hockey. It's a private group. You have to answer a couple yes or no questions to get in. And there's no spam. But the conversations continue. You can ask questions of the group. You can ask questions anonymously. Uh, people have done that as well. It's just a great resource for you um, as a hockey parent uh, or coach. So I want to thank all of you again for listening. You are just an amazing audience. You, you have brought us to the masses when it comes to this podcast, and we're forever grateful. And we hope you have a wonderful week wherever you are in the hockey world. This is Liam Mike for Our Kids Play Hockey. We'll see you next week, everybody. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Make sure to like and subscribe right now if you found value wherever you're listening, whether it's a podcast network, a social media network, or our website, ourkidsplayhockey.com. Also, make sure to check out our children's book, When Hockey Stops, at whenhockeystops.com. It's a book that helps children deal with adversity in the game and in life. We're very proud of it. But thanks so much for listening to this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey, and we'll see you on the next episode.